This is the Gospel for the fifth Sunday in Lent and describes the raising of Lazarus from the dead. St John chapter 11 There was a man named Lazarus who lived in the village of Bethany with two sisters, Mary and Martha, and he was ill. It was the same Mary, the sister of the sick man Lazarus, who anointed the Lord with ointment and wiped his feet with her hair. The sister sent this message to Jesus, Lord, the man you love is ill. And on receiving the message, Jesus said, This sickness will end not in death, but in God's glory, and through it the Son of God will be glorified. Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus, yet when he heard that Lazarus was ill, he stayed where he was for two more days, before saying to his disciples, Let's go to Judea. The disciples said, Rabbi, it's not long since the Jews wanted to stone you. Are you going back again? Jesus replied, Are there not twelve hours in a day? A man can walk in the daytime without stumbling, because he has the light of this world to see by. But if he walks at night, he stumbles, because there is no light to guide him. He said that and then added, Our friend Lazarus is resting, and I'm going to wake him. The disciples said to him, Lord, if he's able to rest, he's sure to get better. The phrase Jesus used referred to the death of Lazarus, but they thought that by rest he meant sleep. So Jesus put it plainly, Lazarus is dead, and for your sake I'm glad I was not there, because now you will believe. But let us go to him. Then Thomas, known as a twin, said to the other disciples, well, let's go too and die with him. On arriving, Jesus found that Lazarus had been in the tomb for four days already. Bethany is only two miles from Jerusalem, and many Jews had come to Mary and Martha to sympathise with them over their brother. When Martha heard Jesus had come, she went to meet him. Mary remained sitting in the house. Martha said to Jesus, If you'd been here, my brother would not have died. But now I know that even now, whatever you ask of God, he will grant you. Your brother, said Jesus to her, will rise again. Martha said, I know he will rise again at the resurrection on the last day. Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life. If anyone believes in me, even though he dies, he will live. And whoever lives and believes in me will never die. Do you believe this? Yes, Lord, she said. I believe you are the Christ the Son of God, the one who was to come into the world. And when she had said this, she went and called her sister Mary, saying in a low voice, The Master's here and wants to see you. Hearing this, Mary got up quickly and went to him. Jesus had not yet come into the village. He was still at the place where Martha met him. And when the Jews who were in the house sympathising with Mary saw her get up and go so quickly and go out, they followed her, thinking that she was going to the tomb to weep there. Mary went to Jesus, and as soon as she saw him, she threw herself at his feet, saying, Lord, if you'd been here, my brother wouldn't have died. At the sight of her tears, and those of the Jews who followed her, Jesus said in great distress, with a sigh that came straight from the heart, Where have you put him? And they said, Lord, come and see. And Jesus wept. And the Jews said, See how much he loved him. But there were some who remarked, He opened the eyes of the blind man. Could he not have prevented this man's death? Still sighing, Jesus reached the tomb. It was a cave with a stone to close the opening. And Jesus said, Take the stone away. Martha said to him, Lord, by now he'll smell. This is the fourth day. Jesus said, Haven't I told you that if you believe, you will see the glory of God? So they took away the stone. And Jesus lifted up his eyes and said, Father, I thank you for hearing my prayer. I knew indeed that you always hear me, but I speak for the sake of those who stand round me, so they may believe it was you who sent me. And when he had said this, he cried in a loud voice, Lazarus, come here. And the dead man came out, his feet and hands bound with bands of stuff, and a cloth around his face. And Jesus said to them, Unbind him, let him go free. And many of the Jews who had come to visit Mary and had seen what he did, believed in him. 
This is one of the most powerful events in all of the four Gospels. It's really rather exciting because Jesus had raised others from the dead. He'd raised the widow's son at Nain. And he'd raised the little 12-year-old girl, Talitha, Talitha Kumi, little girl, I say to you, arise. But there were people, of course, who said these, these other so-called miracles, they weren't really dead. They were in a coma of some kind. It was exactly the same then as it is today. People who didn't want to believe would find reasons, excuses, extra factors. Jesus, knowing that Lazarus was going to die, waited for four days and then went to the tomb. Lazarus was quite an important figure in the world of Jesus and his followers. And even in Jerusalem, he was very well known. Uh, he was known to be a friend of Jesus. And so you would have thought that, as many did, that Jesus would somehow protect him. He wouldn't die. And here we have Jesus weeping at the tomb. It seems to me that Jesus was not weeping so much for what Lazarus went through, but at death itself. Because we need to understand not only the biological reality of death, but what it represents theologically or spiritually. Death is a great evil. Death is closely associated with the devil. Death brings us despair, ultimate closure. It looks like it's the end. For many people, biological death is just a train crash that we, we don't survive. And if Jesus is anything like what he claims to be, he has to be master over death. And so he said, I am the resurrection. I am the life. Whoever believes in me will never die. We can be very alarmed. We are very alarmed by our deaths. We lie in bed, some of us, and wonder what are we going to die from. We wonder if illnesses and pains that we have are the oncoming, the onset of some mortal disease. We've seen our friends die, many of us. And although we don't think of death very much, this present pandemic that is now around us gives us large numbers of people who will die every day. Of course, one of the things we don't hear is that in the month of March, for example, in England, normally 50,000 people would die. So although there are arguments about whether this pandemic is as terrifying as it appears to be with only 1,000 deaths in the 50, and not all of those caused by the pandemic itself, we realise that for a great deal of our lives, people are dying around us, being born and dying, coming and going, and we don't hear very much about it. But death, of course, is the idea, the experience, that we're wrestling with as we try and work out what we're doing here. Jesus weeps at the tomb of Lazarus because he sees the destruction that separation from God our Father has caused on us. However, we understand the story of Genesis. It tells us a spiritual fact, a metaphysical, philosophical proposition that we have been separated somehow from life and slowly we wind down, our bodies decay, we can't replicate properly. We're not in control of the life force that projected us into this world. We lose life, it ebbs away. In some people drastically quickly in accidents, in others slowly until we come to death. Jesus says something quite extraordinary. There is no one in the whole of history there's no one in literature who has confronted death and given any indication they have power over it. There have been plenty of charlatans, of course, plenty of megalomaniacs, but, but death is the final arbiter of what is real and what isn't real. And so asking the question of whether or not Jesus really can raise people from the dead is central to whether or not we believe in him, whether we take him seriously, what our relationship is with him. He delayed these four days, so there could be no doubt at all Lazarus was completely dead. Not only dead, but corrupt. His body stank. And so he comes to the tomb and then performs this quite extraordinary 
miracle. Of course, he only saves Lazarus biologically for a bit. Lazarus would die again. It must have been a bit hard for him to have to go through death twice. Once will be hard enough for any of us. But it's not just biological death that Jesus saves us from. It's eternal death. Wonderfully, death, separation from God, extinction, is located in time, but only in time. Jesus makes sure that death is not eternal. He raises us to life. The life that we had biologically when we were born then gets extended spiritually. If you like, we are modelling now in time what God promises us in eternity. We get a taste for it. Indeed, we find ourselves saying, I can't believe that I won't exist. I can't believe that, that, that death will overtake me. What can it be like to be unconscious for forever? It's beyond our imagination. And in one sense, we've been given this gift of life to deepen our longing for existence, for being. And above all, for loving, for praising. The, the great thing about being a Christian is we get a taste for being forgiven, for loving and for praising. And it's, it's the thing that we are being prepared for, for all eternity. In, in, in crass literature, there are pictures of angels and harps and clouds. And people say, well, this is not really a way of spending eternity. But anyone who's been touched by the Holy Spirit and has experienced the presence of God knows this exquisite ecstasy and delight that we are given when we come into his presence. And in a way, time stops. What it means to be in eternity is that time ceases to run away. This moment of intense passion doesn't end. It can't become boring because we don't have any sense of its elongation. But we are called to this exquisite ecstasy of adoration, of being forgiven, of, of loving, of adoring. And all that moves us now, all the beauty, all the poetry, all the music, all the ecstasy, all the human love is caught up in a relationship with God and purified. And it never runs out again. It doesn't die. It doesn't suffer entropy. It doesn't run down. And that's what we're being prepared for. We're being prepared for the ending of time and the ending of death. The spiritual hegemony of Satan is ended. It only lasts in time. He cannot have us die eternally. But to do this, we need to be engaged with Jesus. Jesus says, I am the resurrection. It's our relationship now that we practice with him that roots us in the promise of this, of this eternal life. It is being forgiven and forgiving that binds us to him. It's loving and adoring that binds us to him. And Jesus, who constrains death in time, will carry us through death, through judgment, into his presence. In one sense, the death of Lazarus offered as close as proof as you could get, second only to the resurrection of Jesus himself. But now we have these two, these two events, this man dead for four days, raised from the dead by Jesus' voice, and Jesus' resurrection himself to prove that he belonged to this other dimension outside space and time. We live inside space and time. We do our loving and our praying in it, our forgiving in it, our trusting in space and time. But space and time is, is running down just rather more slowly than we do. And what Jesus wants to do is to welcome into this, into this other dimension, the dimension that Lazarus went into, this beyond time and space, beyond death, that he came back to carry us to. Loving Jesus is the most astonishing adventure. It gives us the courage to look at our mortality, our coming deaths, this brick wall that we will hit, and to know that we have very many good reasons for believing he will carry us through it. Lazarus is alive. Moses and Elijah, spotted on the hill of transfiguration, are alive. 
Mary, the mother of God, is alive and constantly breaks into time and space to renew the church in her apparitions. The saints are alive, as we see in the book of Revelation, very much engaged in our struggle. And Jesus wants us to know that our struggle is always the same. It is with the world, the flesh and the devil, for they don't last. They are all temporary. They are all, to some extent, illusions. He wants us to find our roots, not in this world, but in the reality of heaven, which everything in this world that is good points to. He wants us to find our being not in, in all the pleasures of being uh, alive, but in the exquisite pleasure of adoration and worship. He wants us to know that we have to struggle to get there, struggle not only with our egos, but actually with a profound spiritual evil that is the cause of this death, that is the cause of Jesus weeping, because he knows that this form of evil has a limited power over us, but he wants the power to be limited. He wants it to be limited so that when we come to judgment and we are faced with accusation, the power of the devil is dissolved by Jesus saying, I forgive you. You are forgiven. He wants it so that when we come to the moment of death, the power of the devil that kills us by separating us from God is dissolved because Jesus says, I raise you to eternal life. Stay with me. He wants us to know that the power of the devil, which is about despair and hopelessness, is dissolved because in Jesus all hopelessness disappears. The longing that we had to live forever, this sense of bemusement that death brings, as well as tears, is solved when we see that time and death are temp time and space are temporary. So we look to what Jesus did in the Gospels. We look to the raising of Lazarus. We look to his resurrection. We look to the transfiguration, where we see Moses and Elijah. Uh, alive and well and engaged in the kingdom project and we take courage and realize that what we are here to do is to prepare for this great moment this enormous adventure of moving beyond death in his arms in his love forgiven and carried where we could never carry ourselves jesus shows us the resurrection by acting it out in real life with real people. And then he invites us to trust him, to go with him. We begin that journey of trust now as we pray, as we love, as we worship, as we forgive. And wait for the moment of our complete liberation. When we are born again, not only by the Spirit, but into eternal life. No wonder Christians can walk through this life with joy, with confidence. No wonder we have the antidote to fear and hopelessness and accusation. All of it is found in Jesus, in a relationship with him, in our being bound by him, for him and with him forever. To him be the glory and our gratitude and our love. Amen. <laughs>